What does hunting, skittles, orangeries, and parcels have in common? Sacre bleu! Another episode of Bridgerton. Cheerio, everyone. Good day to you all. This is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, of course, I'm coming to you all with another episode of Bridgerton. Season 2, Episode 4, Victory. This episode was directed by Alex Pillay, who directed our previous episode. This episode was also co-written by our showrunner, Chris Van Dusen, along with Jess Brownell. She's the producer and writer who's previously written for the series Scandal and Inventing Anna. And now, let us commence. So we open up this episode and we see that the Bridgertons are still at Aubrey Hall. And additionally, this week, Violet will be hosting her annual Hearts and Flowers Ball, which of course is the year's most coveted invitation in the country. We then see Violet, Daphne, and Mrs. Wilson, the housekeeper, as they oversee the final preparations for the event. We also see Anthony and Kate in their individual rooms, and they both seem to be in a fairly odd space considering recent events. Even Edwina notices that Kate is quite off balance ever since the bee sting. Kate just shrugs that off and suggests that once they return to Mayfair, there will be plenty of suitors vying for her attention. But of course, Edwina is still very determined that Anthony is the one for her. What she is also very certain of is that Anthony has not made his declaration because of Kate. And you can see Kate's face, she's like, uh. Edwina says, you hate one another. You can see the relief on Kate's face when Edwina says that. But Kate also says that maybe hate is too strong a word. Yes, I would have to agree. Hate is much too strong a word at this point. <laughs> this whole time, Edwina thought she needed Kate's help to get Anthony to fall in love with her. But now she realizes that she needs Kate's help to get Anthony to fall in love with Kate. And I was just like, um, <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think that's what you want. <laughs> Next, we see Madame Delacroix, who seems to be settling nicely into her new role as secret messenger for Penelope. Now, instead of Penelope having to make the journey all the way to the printer and risk being seen, Madame Delacroix is now smuggling Penelope's notes to the printer by hiding them in dress parcels. Later, we see everyone gathered together outdoors. Of course, Edwina is still on a mission, so she invites Kate to speak with both herself and Anthony. She even requests that Anthony give Kate a tour of the grounds while she visits with the other ladies. Well, for reasons obvious to us and not quite so obvious to Edwina, neither Kate nor Anthony are here for that. Anthony says he's going to be busy and shooting with the other gentlemen. Edwina says wonderful because Kate is an excellent shot. You can see from Anthony's reaction that he's quite skeptical of this, which naturally irritates Kate. As far as Anthony is concerned, ladies do not hunt. Kate says do not or aren't allowed to. Since one of the maids can act as chaperone, there's nothing stopping Kate from participating. And Benedict, who has just ventured over to the conversation, agrees. Surely we can make an exception just this one time. And who knows, she might even teach you a thing or two. <laughs> Although I have been a little bit up and down with Benedict, I must say it is quite entertaining how delighted he is at stirring up mess and instigating everything. <laughs> Next, we see Colin having a visit with someone very familiar. It is none other than Miss Marina Thompson, cousin to the Featherington family, and now known as Lady Crane. We also discover that Marina has given birth to not one, but two children, twins named Oliver and Amanda. Despite the surprise visit, Marina is actually pleased to see Colin. After a brief chat over tea, she prepares to see him off right as Sir Philip arrives. Sir Philip is very interested in Colin's recent travels. But it's also clear that Marina is somewhat uncomfortable with their camaraderie together. And she's also visibly irritated when Sir Philip invites him to dinner. 
Uh-oh. Next, we see Anthony, Benedict, and Kate out at the hunt. When Kate realizes that everyone is headed to the camp, she notices that the tracks are clearly headed to the left. So it's very likely that they're going to miss their quarry entirely. Yet and still, Anthony suggests they remain with the group. Kate and Anthony then have a brief conversation, and Kate lets Anthony know that her hunting skills came from the royal family that her father was a secretary for. Later on, Kate realizes that her instincts have been quite correct. Deer prefer the edge of the forest, and this area is far too open. I thought it was so, so funny when Anthony gave his hand to Kate to help her over a fallen tree trunk. But instead of taking his hand, she simply hikes up her dress and steps over. Oh my gosh. Anthony's face when he caught that little bit of thigh. I was sorry. Hmm. What's going on in your mind right about now? <laughs> However, when Anthony suggests again that they carry on, he realizes that Kate has completely disappeared. He eventually catches up to her he then finds her crouched down near the ground, positioned and waiting to take a shot. Unfortunately, that gets disrupted by yet another pointless argument initiated by Anthony. Talking about how she disregards the rules and how she does things on her own and had she not been out riding the other morning, then they wouldn't be placed in this very precarious situation. And then they go back and forth about that, about who looked at who first and, you know, why did you touch me there and why did you look at me this way and <laughs> it's a mess, per usual. They then hear Russell in the woods. Kate prepares her gun, but Anthony tells her that she's holding it the wrong way. Although Kate is not here for it, Anthony helps her position her gun correctly. And of course, once again, they are in close proximity and we know how this is about to go. But before anything can happen, they're interrupted by the rest of the hunting crew. Back at Aubrey Hall, we also see that Lady Featherington is still very insistent on Prudence luring Cousin Jack into a proposal. They discuss this while playing a game of Skittles, which is the old-fashioned predecessor to the modern sport of bowling. And much like bowling, it involves rolling a ball towards a set of pins and it was a popular amusement on the lawns of great estates like this one. Back at the Crane household, Marina is very much over it. Sir Philip is going on and on, and he wants to know about the plants in Greece, and Marina's like, you know what? <laughs> it's getting late. I think it's, you know, time for our guests to leave. Sir Philip bids them both a good night and then leaves. As Colin prepares to leave, Marina is very interested in why he came in the first place. He says he came to apologize to all the things he said to her previously and that he forgives her as well. Well, this is Marina we're talking about. And much like last season, Marina once again has some choice words for Colin. She says, I do not need your apology any more than I require your forgiveness. All of this, you and I, is in the past. Colin says, hey, I understand that, but do you ever look at your life and think how things might have gone had we conducted ourselves accordingly? And I was just like, okay, <laughs> Colin, I get where your mind is at, but this is the wrong road, my friend. But Colin keeps on going. He's questioning Sir Philip, and if Marina is really happy with him, I'm just kind of like, <laughs> This is really, really bold. Marina lowers the boom. She tells him that he is simply a boy caught up in his own fantasies. Not everyone will be guaranteed a fairy tale ending, but she is perfectly content with her children, Sir Philip, and the life that they've built together. She is now a very different woman, and she will not allow herself to be thrust into a world of fantasy again. So, Colin thanks her for her time and prepares to leave. But Marina has one last thing to say. She tells Colin that instead of looking backwards, perhaps you should look to the people in your life that you already make happy. Perhaps you should seek them out because your future will certainly not be found in the past with me. Damn! Oh my God. 
when I tell you Marina ate him up. I mean, a small part of me felt bad, but overall, I was here for the honesty. I mean, you may not like what Marina said, but I personally appreciate it when people come with the cold, hard facts. And honestly, that's just life. At some point, we have to face reality. We have to let go of the life we thought we would have and just embrace the here and now. And it's not really beneficial to continue to reach back because even for me, the what ifs, the what ifs, the what ifs, those don't propel you forward. All they do is keep you in the back and keep you in the past. And that is not conducive to living a life when we have to go forward. Kate arrives home, but Edwina is not interested in hearing any stories about the hunt. She just wants to know if Kate and Anthony are in a much better space with each other. Kate says, yes. Edwina is delighted and she tells Kate to keep doing whatever it is she's doing. Again. <laughs> don't know if you want that, but okay. Well, ironically enough, Kate and Anthony end up running into each other in the middle of the night while it's raining inside the study with only a few candles lit and everyone else is asleep. I'm just like, this is really not helping the situation. <laughs> Kate mentions that her father used to read to her during monsoons. So now whenever she hears a storm, her thoughts immediately turn to him. Anthony notices that Kate has a book and he mentions that these books were his father's most treasured possessions. So it's very clear that they both understand and can relate to loss as far as a parent is concerned. Kate asks how Anthony's father passed and once he mentions that he was stung by a bee, it all makes perfect sense. Again, we are in close proximity. But thankfully, a strike of lightning shocks her to her senses and she leaves. Later, we see Daphne speaking to Violet and she tells her about her conversation with Edwina. She says that Edwina is definitely a diamond. She knows when to smile and what to say at all times. But Daphne always envisioned Anthony partnering with someone a lot more like him. It feels like he and Edwina barely know each other. She also attempts to broach the same subject with Anthony, but gets dismissed. We then jump forward to the ball and all our regulars are in attendance. Eloise gets drawn into a dance against her will. Of course, the conversation goes downhill. He appears to have the same opinions of women that most of the gentlemen in society also hold. Eloise is not here for it and she doesn't care. She decides to dip out of the dance while everyone is watching. She also makes it very clear to Violet that she knows what a disappointment she is to her, which was actually really sad to see. Edwina figures that since this is her last chance for a proposal, Kate needs to dance with Anthony. Oh my gosh. I mean, he'll have to ask for a blessing anyway. That look that they give each other when they realize what they're being made to do really says it all. But they comply and they begin to dance as a classical rendition of Dancing on My Own by Robin plays in the background. The energy, the vibes, the eye contact, it's all there. Anthony wants to know that if he asked for Edwina's hand, would Kate give him permission? Kate wants to know if Anthony can make her sister happy. Anthony pauses and he's not saying anything. Kate's like, okay, no, 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 wait. If your silence means that you're reconsidering any of this, Anthony says, is that what you want for me to reconsider? I said, uh-uh, <laughs> no, you can't do this. <laughs> like, like now at this moment, <sighs> Kate says, you know what? It really doesn't matter what I want. I am headed back to India as soon as my sister gets married. You can see the clear shock on Anthony's face when she tells him that. And you can also see a very interesting expression on both Lady Danbury and Daphne's faces. But no, that is not the end of this heated debacle. Anthony marches into the study and Kate follows shortly after. Kate lets Anthony know that he vexes her and that she hates him. Once again, 
we are all up in each other's faces with heavy breathing. <laughs> I cannot take this breathing. But who should walk in and interrupt this heated moment but Daphne? <laughs> Daphne runs out of the room and Anthony follows. He makes it clear to Daphne, look, I don't know what you just saw or what you think you just saw, but I am marrying Edwina. Daphne tells Anthony that he needs to be honest with himself because these kinds of feelings, i.e. love, they always have a way of coming to the surface. We also discover that Lady Featherington has concocted a new scheme of foolishness by luring Cousin Jack to the orangery under the pretense of a business meeting, while also sending Prudence there as well. She then leads a bunch of attendees at the ball to the orangery, where she is shocked to discover that Cousin Jack and Prudence are there, unchaperoned. She then uses the scandal as leverage for a forced proposal with Prudence. What is this? I was so embarrassed. Later that night, Lady Danbury has another conversation with Kate. As I've said plenty of times before, Lady Danbury is nobody's fool. She knows what's going on. She knows what time it is. She knows that it's much more than dislike that is about to disrupt this proposal. So she makes it very clear to Kate that she needs to communicate with her sister about whatever it is she might feel. The next day, Cousin Jack confronts Lady Featherington. Naturally, she's not worried about anything she's done because, of course, she did it to secure her family's future. But apparently, all she secured for her family is a life of poverty. Surprise, surprise. Cousin Jack is penniless and the mines are empty. Oh, and as far as Philippa's dowry is concerned, he basically held off the finches with promise of payment and a counterfeit ruby necklace. The man is broke. He has zero zilch nada. You see, the only way for Jack to help secure their futures was to marry someone wealthy. In this case, Cressida Cowper. But that's all over now. As usual, Lady Featherington has cut off her nose to spite her face. Finally, we see everyone gathered together at Aubrey Hall to see off the Sharmas and Lady Danbury. Edwina has relegated herself to disappointment, realizing that she and Kate have done everything that they could possibly do. It's at this point Kate recalls Lady Danbury's advice and begins to reveal something to Edwina. But as always in situations like this, she's much, much too late because the Viscount Bridgerton has officially proposed to Edwina, and Edwina has officially accepted victory, indeed. And that closes out episode four, Victory. Whoo, what a mess. <laughs> there was a lot going on here. As I've said before, this whole Anthony, Kate, Edwina triangle, now what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, now we propose, what is the next step from here? And we still have this lingering thing with Anthony and Kate. So I'm just like, oh boy, I don't see it ending well. And Lady Featherington and her foolishness, I cannot... I almost can't feel bad because it's like, here you go, jumping the gun again. Like, had you like really just assessed the situation correctly, we would have been fine. But once again, we are broke, we're broke, broke, we're broke, broke, broke. And it's your fault. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> a lot going on. But I am really, really excited to see how all this plays out. Because like I said, it's a mess, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> And as always, feel free to comment below and leave your thoughts on this recap and this episode. So, once again, this is D Movie Man, signing off, and I'll see you at the movie.